Uh, I was going to give you sort of a U.S. perspective on data centers and cover a couple of our data centers. Um, I'm, as uh, the introduction said, with the National Renewable Energy Lab in the U.S., we have a system of national laboratories that do um, scientific research, essentially. In the case of ours, it's uh, scientific research on renewable energy, solar, wind, biomass, uh, et cetera, uh, and energy efficiency, so energy efficient buildings. And I'm in the energy efficient buildings portion of our work, which relates to data centers. I'll be here tomorrow for the S Labs conference also. Um, so again, I'll give you perspectives. I'll talk about an air-cooled data center that we have there. Uh, this is, happens to be a picture of it, uh, some of the features, uh, some of its performance. And then our newest data center, which is a HPC uh, data center, um, uh, which is a direct liquid-cooled data center, and, and where we see trends going in the U.S. anyways. Now, so this, this is um, sort of a good introduction met, uh, message. Um, the, the key is obviously we want to maximize our computes per dollar, you know, um, uh, WAPs per flot if you want to think of it that way. Um, if you assume that a, um, a megawatt uh, costs you about a million dollars, we'll call it a million pounds for this discussion per year, um, uh, if you had a 20 megawatt data center, it would cost you 20 million dollars per year. Makes sense? Um, the uh, uh, if you uh, so that's the green. We want to obviously maximize that. The red is uh, uh, PUE. Uh, you guys are all familiar with PUE. Okay, great. Uh, and again, excuse, I'm not familiar with the room here. But uh, if you had a perfect data center where all the energy went to compute, you'd have a PUE of one. And I'll talk about PUE some more. Carried to the extreme. If you um, uh, in the U.S. anyhow, typical data centers are running about 1.8 PUE. So for every unit of energy in the data center, you spend almost another unit of energy in the other stuff. Pumps, fans, chillers, UPSs, that kind of stuff. So I'd just like this graph to illustrate how important it is. If we can take some of this um, and, and save that money, then that's more compute that we can do. That's, that's one of the main messages. Um, so i just like that for a graphical way to see it. Um, and do you like asking questions as we're going or to the end? or? It's, it's up to you guys. I can keep going, but if there's burning questions, please ask. If not, uh, we'll have a good discussion time at the end. Um, so in the U.S., um, we put together a, a best practice guide for energy efficient data centers. Um, and this is just so you can have a reference for it. These slides will all be available, I assume. Um, and, and this is the U.S. reference for it, but it goes through and talks about uh, the IT side, and that's the portion of, you know, where we're working on, like the previous speaker, virtualization, consolidation, making our IT as efficient as possible. Um, I'm going to talk more about the environmental condition side, um, which is air management, cooling, and then also in the uh, benchmarking. There's also a section in about electrical. So it's another reference for you guys uh, uh, here in the UK, just uh, mostly to know what's there as a reference. Um, so what are we trying to do when we cool a data center? This is a, a picture of a typical server, um, is, is what I would call it. And the server consists of uh, memory boards, CPUs, and maybe graphics cards, GPUs, I'll call those. But when you get down to it, a CPU runs at 65C. As long as you keep it below 65C, you're good. So, so that kind of puts it in perspective. That's, that's obviously a very warm temperature. Um, so at the end of the day, all the cooling that we're trying to do is just to keep those in temperature spec. Uh, some of your software programs, you can even monitor CPU temperatures. Um, most of the energy from a, a server, obviously, the, goes from the CPU, graphics cards, memory, 75, maybe 90% of the, the energy goes into those and is dissipated as heat. So it's a, a good context there. Um, in the U.S., we have an organization called ASHRAE uh, that sets uh, thermal guidelines for our data centers, and I believe it's very similar here. Um, and the thermal guidelines, this happens to be a picture of the cover, but states that in um, the recommended range, the range you normally run at, uh, should be up to 27C or so. Uh, so that's the temperature at the front of the server, at the front of the rack. That's a, a good high temperature, higher than your ambient temperature in most cases, in most parts of the UK. Uh, and then occasionally, uh, th there's also an allowable range, 
Uh, and depending on the type of server, uh, you can make that allowable be up to 32C, some servers up to 45C. Again, very warm temperatures. Um, and then uh, humidity is also quite wide, 20 to 80 percent or so. Um, in, uh, so, so again, those are the thermal guidelines. That's, that's all we need to do is at the face of the server to keep that. Um, I'm an engineer. I'm not a computer scientist. <laughs> I'll come clean on that. Uh, us engineers like to plot temperature and humidity, <coughs> uh, the energy of air on what's called a uh, psychometric chart. Anybody ever seen psychometric charts before? Okay, good. At least I'm uh, not the only one. Uh, us engineers use this. I won't spend a lot of time on it since I didn't get a lot of hands, but it's uh, dry bulb temperature on the bottom, degrees C, and then these are lines of uh, humidity. So we can plot um, where the recommended range is, and then the little bit darker line, the allowable range, where we want to uh, keep our, the, the uh, environmental conditions in our data center. And um, knowing that, we can actually, we have weather files uh, for, for everywhere in the world. You know, US, uh, I happen to be in, in Denver, Colorado, Boulder, Colorado. Um, so so uh, you can plot what the typ typical temperature and humidity is for, for a typical year. Every one of these dots, there's 8760 for 8760 hours. Once you do that, then you can start doing um, uh, how you're going to cool the data center. Can you use outside air? It's very dry where we are, so we actually evaporate water into the air. We'll call that evaporative cooling. Uh, but, and then you can plot the different um, uh, psychometric um, cooling strategies. The idea is anyways, uh, anywhere in the world you can get this data, plot it, and figure out how you're cooling your data center. For us, the worst case condition, we call them design conditions. This isn't degrees Fahrenheit, just to confuse you. Um, so, so don't pay much attention, but the idea is that you can overlay the thermal guidelines over into uh, um, recommended, into guidelines that your data center needs. Um, so knowing that, in the UK, do you typically have uh, cooling water or chillers to cool your data centers and, and computer room units, computer room air conditioners, cracks we would call them? So, um, is that typical here? So um, it's typical in the US also. Um, and the, the message is that we don't necessarily have to do that, especially in a climate like the UK. It's, it's, it's cool all the time. So when we, <laughs> well, what's that? Don't rub it in. Yeah, yeah. where we are it is not, it gets hot. Uh, in a lot of the US, most of the US it gets hot. Um, but, but we still, um, the typical anyways is to run a, a computer room air conditioner um, they have a, a, a coefficient of performance. Anyways, uh, to run um, a unit of cooling, we, we use a unit of ton, but, but don't worry about that. A unit of cooling would take 10,200 kilowatt hours for that one unit of cooling. If you do it the same way, but use indirect evaporative um, and direct evaporative and then just direct outside air, you can see most of the time we can do, this is hours per year, 6,000 of the 8,000, we can just use the outside air, bring it in directly and cool our data center. Uh, so this is very much the trend in the U.S., mostly because it's of economics. It saves money, you know? Uh, and that money we save, we can do more compute with. Um, the message is if you look at that and you stay in the recommended range, you can take this 10,000 number down to about 500. It's a 95% cooling savings. If you let it occasionally go in the allowable range, um, all the mechanical cooling's gone. So you can do it all for free. That's, uh, again, a, a good message for the UK climate. And it's good that you have a cool climate in this case. So anyways, uh, realize that the trend in the US is moving in that direction, and it, it reflects in the PUE. Um, again, PUE, you guys are familiar with this, but it's IT power plus facility power, you know, fans, cooling, uh, UPSs, all that kind of stuff, divided by IT. Uh, comes from the, uh, um, the Green Grid, a group in the U.S. of uh, computer manufacturers. Um, industry standard, uh, you know this, the ratio. Uh, it's not perfect. In a survey, at least in the U.S., the average was about 1.8. I, I assume it's somewhere in the U.K. Do you guys know that by chance? I, I'll, I'll bet it is. If you're using computer room cooling units, you're, you're up in that range by default. You, a bit lower? Good. Given your climate, it should be lower. <laughs> um, anyways, um, 
the takeaway, just like that first graph, half the, half the power goes to non-useful stuff. Um, we, can, we can put this into a flow diagram. Um, and basically, you've got a utility coming in, a campus utility, utility of some sort. Some of the energy goes to cooling, your chillers, your computer room, your crack units, fans, et cetera. Not useful work. Some of it goes to UPSs, uh, maybe a pow uh, PDU, a power distribution unit. Uh, and then ultimately, what we're trying to do is IT. You know, that's, that's <coughs> why it's there. Um, so if you take this plus this divided by this, that's your PUE. Pretty straightforward. Um, and then the result is we cre create heat that we need to get rid of. That's that rejected energy. Um, this happens to be a data center. There's a picture of it that I'll talk about here in a moment. But this is just showing a typical PUE uh, for a Meyer data center. Um, we have case studies on this one. You can see it runs in the 1.15 type range year round. Uh, again, if you're not monitoring this with your data centers, you definitely should be, because it tells you a lot. And when then in this case, we're plotting it against outdoor air in Fahrenheit again, I apologize. And as it, gets, as it gets a little bit warmer, we start to get a tiny bit occasionally of mechanical cooling. Typically, it's just, just fans bringing in the outdoor air. But again, that's what it should look like, and you guys should be doing that also. Um, then we came across this. I, I do a lot of data center work, and we started coming across. I'm reusing my waste heat from my data center on another part of my site, my campus, and my PUE is 0.8. Is that possible? No. <laughs> um, so knowing this, knowing that the, the trend is, and this is going to be one of my main messages, that you should reuse this waste heat rather than spend energy to get rid of it, um, we came up with a different metric. Um, so ASHRAE and friends and, and people like um, uh, DOE, EPA, a bunch of organizations in the U.S. The Green Grid is, is our consortium of manufacturers in the U.S. And here's the paper. Uh, we developed another metric called energy reuse effectiveness, or ERE. This, this will become more important worldwide. Uh, and again, the link to that paper is down at the bottom. So what it does, this, you, I like flow diagrams, obviously. And again, I'm an engineer. Um, same diagram here, but instead of just rejecting the energy, we can, if we can do, put it to some beneficial reuse. Uh, and I'll talk about what some of those might be, but like this is a laboratory building. Laboratory buildings have a lot of ventilation air, and in your good cold climate, <laughs> you might have to heat that air. You do have to heat that air. We also have a cold climate, but for example, you could take the IT's energy and use it to heat the building. You could use it to heat a greenhouse, you know, warm a pool, whatever you uh, can imagine. In our climate, you can melt snow with it, uh, those kinds of things. Not much in your climate for that, but uh, anyway. Do something beneficial with the waste heat. That's the message. You paid for it, put it to use. Um, so now this is, um, I'm going to move on to case studies and examples here. Uh, this is a, um, a building. Um, it's this, this building here, this complex. Uh, we call it the research support facility. It happens to be the building I work in. Um, happen to have an office right about there. Um, and it's. Um, uh, a net zero energy building. So between the photovoltaics, solar electric cells, or PV, I'm just going to call them, um, that is here on the roofs of the buildings and on an adjoining parking garage, there's enough PV to offset the annual energy use of the building, including the plug loads and data centers. So in the US, we're trying to move towards self-generation, carbon neutrality, <coughs> net zero energy, all those are sort of interchangeable <coughs> terms. Not quite, but pretty close. So um, that we make the building as efficient as possible, very importantly, make the data center as efficient as possible, and then put enough on-site renewables to power it. So that's the message. Um, uh, it's site, source, carbon, and cost neutral um, is, is the idea. And again, it includes the data center. And I'll talk about why that's important, but it's pretty obvious. Uh, and there's some of the prices. Um, anyways, you get the idea of the building. And uh, within the building, we have a, a data center. Um, just to put it in perspective, the building is about 33,000, 33 and a half thousand square meters. 
the data center is 176 square meters. So, you know, very, very small fraction of it. And keep that in mind on the energy side. Um, a very efficient data center brings in outdoor air through a, a supply fan below the floor and above the ceiling into uh, the cold aisles, you know, to the front of the servers. And then it's a, uh, a fully contained hot aisle, so all the, the hot air is um, uh, on the weaving side of the servers. I assume that's standard practice here. Okay. So standard practice um, goes in, comes out in the hot aisle, is returned by ductwork back to a return fan. Um, it does get very cold where we are. We get uh, way, way below zero. Um, so sometimes we'll have to mix in the wintertime some of this heat with the outdoor air to get so we don't, you know, create snow in our data center. Um, but the excess heat we can either pass to the outside where we don't, if we don't want it, say it's summertime, or pass it on to the building and heat the building with it. Um, so so that's, um, that's the strategy there. You can't always reuse it. Um, but we're, we're running 1.5, 1.16, 1 1.18, somewhere in there. And then an, an, an ERE, energy reuse effectiveness, of somewhere about 0.9. That doesn't sound like an impressive number, and, and I guess maybe it's not. But it's still saying that about 10% uh, of the available energy is used to heat the building. You've got to find a use for that energy. Uh, we control, whoop, there's a Fahrenheit uh, control it. Uh, <laughs> 90 Fahrenheit, um, and again, use the waste heat to heat the building, outdoor air and evaporative cooling. So that's a trend in U.S. data centers, is no mechanical cooling, even in hot climates, on the air-cooled data centers. Um, so I'm going to actually shift gears to liquid-cooled. Any comments or questions on air-cooled? Yeah, in the back there. Just a quick question regarding the data center we saw on the previous page. Yeah. Um, with the photovoltaics, have you included the cost of the embedded carbon the Boy, that's a loaded question. <laughs> um, the, um, <laughs> you had to ask a tough question. The right way to answer that is um, photovoltaics, and I'm glad to talk about photovoltaics, um, but the embodied energy to make them, which is embodied carbon, you know, interchangeable, pays back in our climate in one to two years. Uh, we have a very sunny climate. Um, you know, I'm sure you do too. <laughs> um, but, but even in, in uh, cloudier climates, the payback is slightly longer. Say you get half the sun, it takes twice as long. So it's, it's a fairly quick payback. Um, but to answer your question, no, we didn't, um, but, but we, we could have. Uh, that's a really, that, that question explodes on you very quickly because do you include the embedded carbon in building materials and et cetera. So that's, that's why it's a really loaded question. I, I'm going to stop on that just because I could spend hours talking about that subject. And I'll keep moving on, uh, on data centers. <laughs> Thanks for asking a tough one. <laughs> All right. Um, so we monitor the performance of the data center. I was showing you PUE. We also look at that whole building, that 33,500 square meters, and look where the energy goes. You know, what, what goes to lighting, what goes to plug loads, mechanical, cooling, luckily nothing, uh, heating in our climate, uh, some heating when the snapshot was taken, and then color code it. And in a given day, and this is when it opened a couple years ago, the data center was running just, um, at, say, 110 kilowatts. But even that little data center uh, annually, this is a daily and this is an annual, annual still was a, a significant portion of the energy use of the building. Um, and um, I won't explain more on that graph, but basically it's important to measure, that's the total energy use going in. Some of it goes to fans, some of it goes to compute. Um, and then if you fast forward to, this was uh, the day I left um, a couple weeks ago, if you look, that, that 110 is now 160, 158, 160. Um, the, the problem is, is uh, we've had load, load creep, load growth. I'm sure that never happens here. Um, but uh, this is a business data center, you know, um, just uh, whatever email and business software and the, the business functions of our laboratory. We have uh, 2,500 people or so at our laboratory. So it's like a university, essentially. Um, but because they're not accountable for the energy cost, they, they have load creep. Um, so it's a pretty good example, and it's, it's putting our net zero energy and carbon <laughs> um, uh, status in jeopardy because of this somewhat uncontrolled load growth. 
And again, the problem is, at least for us, that the operator of the data center is not the one who pays the bill. So they don't have a strong, even though it's a very good data center, they don't have a very strong incentive to, to um, watch their power use, their energy use. And again, now you can see, look how big this bar is of the total building uh, compared to what it was just um, you know, a couple years ago. So my message is monitor your performance. Show it, this is a display in our lobby. This is a visual display of where the energy goes in our building. Um, that's uh, very important for visualization so people care. Yeah. So that's the message, visualize, monitor, and watch, watch load growth. But didn't you say that, sorry, for the whole year? Oh, no, no, please. Um, you were saying that because the people are not paying the bills, do you, do you actually find that that visualization does have an impact? It's another loaded question. Um, it does somewhat uh, because um, the, uh, there's a building manager, and the building manager does pay the bills. So he does harass the data center, if you want to use that term. It's like, why is your energy use going up and up and up? So it does help, but the problem is the guy paying the bill, running the data center, doesn't um, uh, hasn't optimized it or continues to let it grow. Rather than pull out old servers when you're putting in new, it just kind of gets more and more and more servers, more and more stuff going on. I guess some of that's natural, but it, it shouldn't have to grow. You know, that's 40% in a couple of years. So does it help? Yes, there's good awareness. Has it, um, and it still runs at a very low PUE. This is the trap of PUE. It's very efficient, but it's still going up. That's, that's uh, part of the other message. So it helps, we're aware of it. Um, there's pressure to fix it, but, but again, without paying the bills, and I'm gonna get to HPC where they do pay the bills, um, uh, it helps, but it's not, we still have an issue here, honestly, that we need to solve, or else we won't be net zero energy like we like to be. So, good question. I'm sorry. Oh, um, oh yes. So you, so this is more kind of like passive Pressure yes. People yeah. Change. Yeah. Yeah. You haven't tried to hook this into procurement processes or anything like this to try and get people to 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 try and bring this figure down. That's that's what you need to do, and no, we have not been successful with that. Um, you know, we buy obviously good servers and virtualize uh, and consolidate, but but um, again, from from my perspective, which is an energy guy. Uh, I think we could certainly do a better job. So it's, it's not been terribly successful uh, across the board. We certainly do buy the good, material, good servers, but we keep buying more and more of them, running more and more stuff. Is that, is that, yeah, yeah. All right, so trends. Um, how many people in here are HPC, high performance computing? Oh, good, most of the room, okay. Most of our computing is HPC. Um, uh, it's, it's an order of magnitude bigger energy use, roughly, um, and I'll talk about that. But um, we just uh, luckily um, built a, a brand new uh, HPC facility, uh, literally brand new. We're still kind of moving into it. Um, but anyways, um, move to liquid coolings. Um, obviously, server fans are inefficient, noisy. You guys know all this. Um, you can put a liquid door on the back of a rack and uh, get some better cooling there. Uh, as power densities go up on rack by rack, it's going to eventually be that you can't move enough air to keep the rack cool. You know, when you get above, say, 30 kW per rack, nominally. Um, so where we see the trend in HPC, certainly, is towards liquid cooling. Um, better thermal stability, if you can keep, get the liquid closer to the CPU. Uh, better waste heat, if you got warm liquid as opposed to warm air, you can pipe it around your campus, for example. Um, if it's warm water, you'll never get condensation, so that's, uh, you don't need chilled water. Um, and then, um, yeah, high temperature cooling, um, eliminate, ex eliminate chillers, chilled water plants, so first cost savings, uh, saves wasted energy and use it for computing, um, and then, uh, yeah, obviously that's where we see it. And this is just a, a simple chart, again, U.S. units, which I apologize for, but it doesn't matter. Rather than for a given unit of cooling, um, you can get that same amount of cooling, a given unit moving 12 degrees. Uh, it's 14 times less energy to move it with a pump than it is with a fan. Pumps are inherently much better at moving energy. Uh, that liquids are better than air. Um, just they're more efficient. So that's the takeaway. You can also, with a liquid, get much better heat exchange. Liquid to liquid is better than a liquid to air, like a coil, like you'd have in a computer room cooling unit. 
Uh, so there's theoretical reasons why you want to do this, mostly pump energy as opposed to fan energy. Um, so in the U.S., this ASHRAE has uh, uh, come up with a, a thermal guideline for liquid cooling also. Um, you can just do a search for that. 2011 is the latest version. Um, and they classify it, they classify the compute as different types in this guideline. And it's sort of interesting to walk through it. So there's a compute type, and then there's the main cooling equipment and supplemental cooling and temperature ranges. Um, for the first ones, the main cooling is chiller and tower. The backup is, we use the term economizer, that means free air cooling, outdoor air cooling. Um, uh, when you get to W, like a W3, the main cooling is a cooling tower, um, you know, a, a liquid place to uh, reject the heat. Uh, people are familiar with that term. Uh, and then the backup's a chiller. Um, again, uh, here, uh, free cooling, no backup. And then when you get here, the, the world sort of changes. And this is what's interesting, is that the main cooling source is the heating system. So if you can take the heat and use it to heat your building, heat your whatever, and then the backup is a cooling tower. Um, so that's, that's the, the direction we see this eventually moving. So um, again, uh, so you don't need a chiller or any of that, and you can mostly reject that heat to something else, again, your campus conceptually. Uh, and the, uh, the one I'm gonna talk about, the HPC, uh, we call it the ESIF, but it uses 24C supply, about 40C return. So, so and I'll have a bunch of slides on this one. That's very low temperature return. So that, that's very low temperature, um, 40 degrees C available to the building, if I'm thinking. Yes. Of the building like this. Yep, yep. Absolutely. Can you explain if you're using heat pumps or any other ways of operating um, that? Yeah, that's so. Useful into the no, you know, it turns out for like laboratory buildings like this complex, you don't need real warm water <laughs> to heat the air. You know, you only need to heat it to room temperature, right? So um, you need a little bit bigger coil because the temperature is a little bit lower, but you could, it's a little bit deeper coil. Uh, you could do it with heat pumps, but then you have to pay the energy for the heat pump. Best if you can use it direct. Uh, a lot of our buildings, I, I kind of blew through it, but that uh, RSF is radiant cooling, radiant heating. So the ceiling is a, a radiant panel, radiant slab. And if you heat that, you can use very low temperature water to, to do all the heating. Uh, as opposed to air-based heating. Again, this is the engineer talking to the computer scientists. 40 degrees C you can do a lot with. It, again, it's not standard steam temperatures like on a campus, but uh, it's plenty warm, it's way above room temperature is the message. Um, so, so we do all our heating with that, and I'll get to that in these. So good question though. Um, so in this new data center that, um, uh, that I'll talk about here, we call it the uh, uh, the ESIF data center happens to be this black piece in the middle. We got an office wing where the scientists sit, and then we have a laboratory wing in the back. Um, we happen to do grid integration, high penetration of distributed generation into grid studies here. But we also do our main computing here. Um, uh, so it's got a, um, it's uh, about a, a thousand square meter facility, the HPC room itself. Uh, ultimate build out of 10 megawatts. We have a nice climate, but so do you. Uh, direct water to the rack. The water goes right to the rack. Um, that's the direct cooling. Um, big takeaway is the data center manager is responsible for all data center costs. So he's responsible for his HPC equipment, running it, including the energy cost. So now he has an incentive to manage energy. Um, and then the waste heat, heat is captured and used to heat the labs and the offices. Again, radiant uh, heating and cooling. Uh, we believe it's one of the most efficient data centers in the world. Um, uh, it had to be by contract uh, 1.06, and we're hoping it's going to be slightly better. We'll tell you in a year. Uh, and then, again, lower capital expense and operating expense. That's our terms for that. Uh, just became operational in January. We'll get the full HPC about a petaflop in um, uh, August this year, the full full build out. We're kind of partially build out. And then um, it's all modular. So as we add a lot more computer, we can add more uh, uh, pumps, basically. Um, so basically, big, oh yes. Uh, just a quick question. Yeah. Um, that use of water cooling, does it affect the equipment that you can then put in the rack? Do you have to have 
equipment that marries up to having water cooled in the back end? Yes, you do. <laughs> uh, so it's different equipment. So that's a really key question. So we actually, knowing that we wanted to move this way because we see the industry gonna, going to move this way, we started out by calling all the major HPC vendors. You know, in the U.S., it's Cray, IBM, HP, names like that, probably similar names here, um, and said, hey, can you do it? There was a few years before. Some said yes, some said no. Um, enough said yes that we build our data center without, uh, you know, uh, air cooling, without uh, chilled water cooling. Uh, and then we put the spec out for the computer saying we need this much compute capacity and it's got to be cooled by 24 C water and the water has to leave at at least 40 C. Um, and then once we had that out and we'd been working with vendors, vendors all of a sudden said, oh yeah, we can do that. <laughs> um, so now actually the, the big three, HPM, Cray, and IBM all offer direct liquid cooling. Um, so, so the industry's changing very quickly. They offer it because they can get better thermal control and you know, th they see the industry moving that way. Yes? Hasn't this sort of thing been around for a very, very long time? Yeah, you know, it's, it's back to the future. Yeah, if if people have been in HPC for a while, Cray did this back in the early 80s, maybe, right? The Cray XP <coughs> series, anybody around from those days? It's it been around, it had went out of favor for a long time. Everybody went to air cooling. And now power costs are going up so dramatically that it's like, oh, we, we should go back to water cooling. So yes, it has been around. It, it went out of favor for quite a while. And the commercial people like Google and, and Microsoft are using water cooling as well, aren't they? Are they? They are not. They are still buying commodity servers, um, custom commodity servers, uh, but doing just direct free air cooling. Uh, they're not at water cooling yet because it's different. It's a different application. So, uh, and they do it very well, uh, Google, Facebook, et cetera. And they do it on a very large scale, it may be a 1.1 PUE. Whether that part of the mo uh, mo um, market will change the liquid cooling, I think so, but I, I'm not certain of that. It's a good question. Uh, maybe somebody in the room knows that. I don't know that. <laughs> Just as a comment, at, at Edinburgh, um, the EPSRC, um, Archer, or whatever it's called, the, the, whatever, whatever Hector's son of is called, um, <laughs> is um, running at 1.18. And that's currently, we're still working with air cooled yep. setup. It's, 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 it's been running at 3 megawatts, but it's uh, likely to move up to 5 megawatts in, in, its, um, in its current, in its most recent uh, extension. And it's the next generation we're looking at, at, at uh, water cooled. We are in the, it, that, that facility is in the country, and, and it is cooler. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, and there you but should be able to open the door if that was the comment. You're right. <laughs> Um, but but I, we see it the same way in that we see that evolution coming very quickly, you know. But we're, we, bought, we bought our next generation right now, and it's, we're leading it. Uh, but we happen to be... We'll be buying from the same guys. You will, and, and they'll be offering liquid cooling, and it will be competitive. Yeah, yeah, so you see the market going the same way. Again, this is HPC. It's unclear where the Googles are going to go. Yes? Um, Peter Newton, uh, UCA. Uh, query. With, I went to uh, a briefing three or four months ago about Dell looking at increasing the, op the temperature operating of, yep. of, of their server hardware up to potentially 30 degrees and beyond. Yep. With the water cooling, can you just... Is it going to be designed to just operate around 24 degrees C, or does it give that flexibility to do it, it? It'll be even warmer. You know, in our climate, we can make that for free every hour of the year, so we pick that number. Uh, and then we can get a, the, the bigger you can get your temperature differential, the less mo fluid you need to move. The trend will be moving up towards like 30 C. Uh, if you looked at, and, and maybe beyond, where you can make it for free in every climate everywhere in the world. Uh, so our pick is a low end pick. You can, you, when, when this gentleman at Edinburgh, I think you said, buys his David next, uh, where? David Summer, yeah, every university. Uh, yeah, uh, when David buys his next set of HPC, it will be a warmer number. <laughs> Not you personally, you don't have tens of millions of dollars. <laughs> um, anyway, yes, it will be warmer. Um, but again, we can make it, so, so why not? Um, uh, so high quality waste heat, most of it, you know, 90, 90 plus percent goes direct to liquid. 
There is a little bit that goes to air, less than 10%. Actually, our legacy equipment is what goes to air. We had, had to move temporary equipment over. High power directly to the racks in the US, 480 volts. Here it might be 380 volts. Um, but running high power right to the rack, so you don't have all the distribution losses. Um, and then the takeaway is think outside the box. Don't be satisfied with uh, energy efficient data center. Look at using the waste heat. So that's what I'm going to talk about more. Heating surrounding buildings. Uh, uh, on your campus, say office buildings, laboratory buildings, et cetera. Um, and then having dashboards similar to what I showed before to monitor its performance. Is it really doing what we expect? Um, so this is a cross section of our data center. Um, and it's uh, when you guys come visit, let me know and I'll tour you around. Uh, Colorado's a nice place. <laughs> uh, good for skiing if there's skiers in the room. Uh, but it's a, a cross-section. We like to talk about like the, the visible man, if any of you guys had that uh, when you were growing up. Uh, I did. Uh, so you can see it. Everything's set up for tours to show this off, show this technology off. Uh, we have a tie to the campus. We have mechanical, which is also uh, where the air moves through, but that's where all the pumps are. And then the, uh, the actual data center, and then an interstitial space for the air cooling. But everything's big windows, so you can see directly into all the mechanical rooms, not just the data center. So not just blinking lights for data center uh, racks, but you know pumps, fans, that kind of stuff. Um, everything's color coded and monitored. Um, so just some specifics. Day one, it's two and a half megawatts capacity. Um, it has an ultimate build out of about ten, about a petaflop currently. Uh, no, no mechanical cooling. Again, it sits in the middle. I'll keep going here. Um, Again, typical is uh, 1.5, let's say, to 1.8. We're actually expecting like a 1.04, so only 4% goes to other stuff. Uh, so it's more efficient than a typical data center. Um, the idea is, here's the data center, here's this in the building, that you can take the heat and export the heat. Uh, some of my colors didn't show up on this, but export it to other parts of the building. That's what this is supposed to show here. Or to uh, cooling towers if you uh, need to get rid of it. Oh, there's the one I was thinking about. So exporting it to heating the office, like radiant heating. Heating the laboratories, again, we have a lot of ventilation there, just like in this building for uh, doing that, or heating snow melt into the campus. Um, expecting an ERE of uh, about 0.7, so about 30% of the energy is reused for those sorts of things. And I'm near the end here, so, um, so that's what we're expecting. Um, here's a cross section, again, just showing 75 Fahrenheit, in this case, water, going back at at least 90 Fahrenheit. Again, 24C, roughly 40C, the equipment. We ended up buying HP equipment, but Cray, et cetera, is, is very similar. Uh, some of it goes to air, about 10% to air, 90% goes direct liquid to the racks. Um, so now some takeaway messages. Um, uh, you got to think sort of three-dimensional optimization, if you want to use that term. Um, we know how to do this. You guys know we know how to build energy efficient data centers. Uh, and you should. Uh, if you're not getting in a, the 1.1 range, you, you can do better, certainly. Um, but we also need to look at the IT consumption, the, uh, um, the watts per flop, if you want to call it that, and then maybe energy reuse. So we know how to do this. Here, we, we always want to increase our work per watt, if you want to use that term. Uh, and you, you can do that by getting to a very good PUE, getting rid of fans and servers. Those are uh, um, wasted energy, all those fans in there. Pretty significant. And obviously, newest processors use more, are more efficient. Uh, you guys all know this. Um, and then the last axis is you paid for all this. You paid for some of this. Use it. Put it, to, put it to use. Heat your campus. Do something with it. But we see this direct liquid cooling, or some, even if it's air cooling, using the, the waste heat to do stuff with is where the world of data centers is going. Uh, if it keeps the energy use keeps going up, at least you can use it for something else. Uh, so we want to optimize all three of those in a good data center design, kind of to minimize the life cycle cost of doing our computations. Um, so some next steps. Uh, obviously, energy efficient infrastructure, big, big uh, pipes, pumps, high voltage. Um, efficient HPC, obviously, capture and reuse the waste heat. 
And then can we optimize our workflows? Like if we need heat in our building, do we can we run our computers higher? If we don't need heat, can we turn them down? Those sorts of things. It really starts to make you think beyond our normal uh, compute world. Uh, and then we can, do, can we do this part of a larger ecosystem? Campus is what I mean by that. Um, so in our campus, and, uh, I showed you a picture of the campus. We have lots of buildings. Uh, we have lots of solar. We have some wind. Uh, can we start looking at our renewable resources and how they line up with our computing needs? If we got a lot of sun, start running the computers hard. If we don't, you know, with wind, et cetera. Uh, we use the waste heat when we need it. And then if we're starting to hit a peak demand, can we ramp our workload down with our computers to, uh, to avoid setting a new uh, facility demand peak from, uh, from our utility? So think, think outside just the data center. Are we there yet? No. <laughs> but this is the direction we're trying to go, is to uh, optimize the workload of the data center for waste heat, utility costs, and obviously uh, science. You've talked about using the waste heat for heating, but you, you, you have quite a cooling mode of the summer, presumably, in your, in your office building. Um, Do you use it absorption chillers on? The temperatures aren't quite high enough for absorption chillers so yet. Yeah, you know, that's, it's, you need a little bit higher temperature than that. You need quite a bit higher temperature than that, actually. Uh, it'd be great if you can do that. Um, in our climate, we don't have to do a whole lot of cooling, and you shouldn't have to in your climate either. So, so the amount that we would need for cooling, for running chillers, uh, absorption isn't that much. In our climate, heating is the big driver. It's a very cold climate. If you remember that psychometric chart, it gets way below freezing most many hours of the year. Uh, if you could figure that out, that would be great. <laughs> There's no commercial products that do that yet. So great comment, but not there yet. Have you, all the stuff you've been looking at uh, so within your own borders, so to speak. Yep. Have you looked at the, the source of the energy that you're bringing in from outside your borders and the infrastructure and the efficiency of the infrastructure bringing it in? Um, an, another, another good detailed question, and, and yes, uh, we have. Let me just make sure that I'm... I'm going to run out of time here because I think I'm probably, <laughs> am I fine? Okay. Um, so have we looked at it? Yes, that goes to the carbon footprint side of the question. Uh, turns out the U.S. grid is dirty. So, um, we, we have a lot of coal switching to gas with a little bit of renewables. Does this sound familiar at all? <laughs> Um, so it's, pretty, it's a pretty dirty grid. Uh, it, it varies in the U.S. by states. You know, if you have good hydro, it's a cleaner grid, uh, et cetera. If you have really good wind, <laughs> it's getting better. Um, but um, have we looked at it? Yes, and we looked at the carbon uh, impact of our energy. Um, but, but that's a tough one to control your grid. Um, so we're just trying to minimize our, uh, our draw from the grid. And we still have a significant draw from the grid. I'm not sure I'm answering your question, though. What was the? Well, you are not past you, but I'm, I'm thinking in terms of being, you say you have a, a significant draw from the grid, so that you're in a position of pressure, which you've been applied to that dirty grid, and say we want to be greener energy. Uh, yep, and that's a whole other uh, discussion. It gets into national priorities on your energy mix. Uh, uh, in the U.S., the uh, U.S. hasn't been great nationally at coming up with, we'd call it a renewable portfolio standard, or how clean your grid is, carbon footprint of your grid, you know, uh, tons of CO2 per megawatt hour, that kind of thing. States have been better. Individual states in the U.S. have done better, but nationally we haven't done a great job. It's slowly getting better, but we can apply pressure, but we're a small part of it, and we do apply pressure, but again, we're a small part of it. Oh yeah, yeah. But we, as we, as my lab, are a small part of it. That's all. HPC is significant, but it's still um, probably only three, per, two, or a couple percent of the U.S. energy use. Uh, so it's still small compared to other stuff. H have you guys been successful with that? It's a great comment, and and ultimately, if the grid was much cleaner, then there wouldn't be the carbon impact that there is. Well, the U.S. is big, and we go where you. Oh yeah, we haven't led very well there. <laughs> being being perfectly honest, we have our yeah. That's a whole nother beyond HPC discussion. Uh, but that's the main focus of the work of our lab is renewable energy, solar, wind. Again, is to make those so that they're cheaper, so that you just do it because because it's cheaper than burning coal. Um, the right answer is obviously carbon tax, et cetera. Yes. 
you were talking about getting more, what did you call it, flock per watt? Yeah, yeah, com uh, computes per watt, you know, whatever, whatever term you want to use. How much work is going into that to, you know, make but, the processes more efficient? Uh, by us, none. By the intels of the world, a lot. You know, uh, Intel and all those kinds of people, IBM, et cetera, that's, that's how they sell their product. You know, they can do more compute with less energy. Um, hi, Peter. Hi. Peter is who invited me here, so. <laughs> um, so, uh, so there's a lot going in. I mean, it's like every generation of Intel processor, just to pick a brand, is better than the previous. It can do more computations per watt. But, we, but all we seem to do is increase the number of computations we need to make. So we don't, we don't, that's, we don't seem to be taking advantage of that at all. But that's not Intel's problem. No, that's, no. that's your problem <laughs> and our problem. Sure. Because the, the more computing we can do, the more computing we yeah. do. So it gets a little bit more efficient, you know, better flops per watt. But then our workload keeps going up, so you can't. We, uh, ultimately, we can't keep doing this as an industry. You know, eventually we gotta say, hey, I don't need to run the climate model to every square meter in the world, uh, or you know, whatever HPC type stuff you're doing. Um, is it being limited in the U.S.? No, it, it continues to grow dramatically, but it, it can't obviously forever. I don't. Anybody else in the room? That's more of a room discussion question. I, I would say that in the U.K have the dash for gas here. Yeah, the yeah. The regulation of the energy market has led yep. to a, a, a large investment in gas, which a lot of people think is, although you know, some people see it as clean, it's, it's still it's, in terms of carbon. It's, it's cleaner, but it's not clean. Um, <laughs> and I think some, some good noises have been made in the past about renewables, but, but it keeps feels like the event horizon keeps 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 going away um, in terms of, of um, really knuckling down to driving um, um, a cleaner grid. Sure. But I and think also we have a, a, a sort of slight problem now. We, we have devolved. The United Kingdom is, is, is splitting into a number of nations, and David's in Scotland. Perhaps we're something about the Scottish. Not yet. <laughs> Oh, no, not, not separate yet. You mentioned you were on a... It's, that's a much bigger discussion beyond, yeah, yeah. beyond this room, obviously, no, no, you know. I'm going to say that, that um, it, it's, not, it, it's maybe it's, not monolithic here, perhaps it used to be. And, and actually, that's what we do our compute for, that megawatt or 10 megawatts, is to try to make these renewables better. You know, better wind turbines, better solar, better biomass, et cetera. So, but, you, you mentioned you, the campus services. Yeah. Um, here at, at Liverpool, they've just reinvested in cogeneration, which is a low zero carbon technology, and they've just modified from having gas turbines to reciprocating engines. So they're getting quite good um, carbon efficiencies mm -hmm. of, of their grid private wire on the campus here, as we are in, in Edinburgh. Um, but uh, so, and, and I think that's that's obviously where. Why this efficiency is as opposed to just being connected to the grid, like like Hector is, unfortunately, because it's in the country. Um, but the, the, but fi fi finding a, a, a collaborative use um, is one thing. I've and, got a question that's not a, not a, and I just not a, let me comment on that. If you've got a, a good cogeneration grid like this campus, a lot of my talk of waste heat becomes tougher because you might already be trying to give away your heat, yeah. and that's where I think you were going with that. And, and it's a fair comment. Not everybody's going to be in that position, um, but but it is free heat that you're you're. If you can do something with it, again, ventilation air for a lab building or something is is good. But it, it is tougher if you've got a cogeneration campus. My question Agree. is back to computing colleagues um, as to there are different ways to achieve um, a, a calculation or whatever it is that you're all, that's needed, and the, that's the old way. And, and then obviously, um, if you're just continuing to do more computing, more computing or whatever, if there are, are, are it's a question, are there cleverer ways that you can do those same compute, computational questions um, in a smaller amount of time or a, and so on? Because that's really, Otherwise, we're just chasing ahead of you as, as facilities people saying, yeah, yeah, we can make it bigger and bigger. But it's re reinventing things. It's a bit like the space management question in, that, in our sector, um, not, not really being addressed <laughs> I mean, in, in terms of things. We're, we're just looking at efficiency of the buildings instead of what's going on in the buildings. 
question to both of you. Uh, Brian Bennington, University of Leeds. I'm not sure how, how many will have heard of the isotope wraps that Leeds University has been experimenting yeah. with. That, that's quite a, a very clever idea now, although it's in its infancy, it is maturing. Um, they're, they're actually putting the blades inside inogen, inside the liquid, so, so that it's sealed in, and that takes away 99.99% of the heat. Currently, for a 20 kilowatt rack, it's using in the region of 5 watts to cool 20 kilowatts, which is pretty damn good, but you can only put three vendors' blades in the in there at the moment, but they're working on it, of course. It's, it is immature at the moment, but it's, it seems to be a very, very good uh, prop that's moving forward. And you can, you, fit, you, you attach a water pipe to it, it yeah. doesn't even have to be clean. Uh, and you attach your hose at the other side and attach it to radiate as whatever you want to get rid of the heat, or you can just use an exchange. Yep, same, same idea, it's idea. just, yeah, no, and it, that's a great technology. It's another version of, it's essentially direct liquid cooling, it just, yep. the racks are set in this form or of some sorts. And that, that's a competing technology and a good one, but it still is the message is, and, and his question is, you know, the, making the compute as efficient as possible. Uh, it's just another way of getting direct liquid cooling, um, and, a, and a good one again. I, I agree. Um, I think in the back of the room sure first. The question uh, about efficiencies in computing is yes, it can be done, but no, it's not economic. Basically, because it, the compute is cheap, and it's cheaper to use mega blocks than it is to spend time and money getting a more efficient algorithm. And until such time as, as compute gets expensive, that's going to be not and, and it, it actually goes back to one of my points is that you got to make sure you've got all the costs in there of what your compute is, including the energy cost. And eventually, his question is, if, you know, ultimately it does cost you so much that, that you might have make the code better. Obviously not yet, though, is, is your point. Yeah. Uh, now, now here. Yes. Yes, the University of Hertfordshire. Um, I would suggest that actually there's a fourth generation of efficiency, uh, so a fourth dimension of efficiency, and that's... Um, as you're talking about, that's the efficiency of the code, but also the workload. Um, and yep. it's about driving that down as well. Because yep. in, a, in an HPC environment, yeah, maybe it's not cost justified to fiddle with algorithms to try and reduce workload. But certainly in an enterprise environment, uh, there's a lot of wasted um, use, utilization of CPUs. And you can't guarantee that high IT utilization equals efficient computing, because that's not necessarily so. Plus also, there's a, there's a massive um, increase in unstructured data, you know, and, and there's a lot of duplication, and, you know, storing data online costs money, yep. costs power, you know, energy, and carbon, and, you know, reducing that and, and streamlining that would also make a massive difference. Absolutely. Um, why, why do you have to, you know, who wants to call you know, the, the IT that you don't need. Exactly. Uh, that, that, was, that was the message of uh, PUE 1.0 whatever. You know, we can do really well. Focus on the one. You know, focus on the compute itself. Focus on making that as efficient as possible. We, we, you know, whether you're at 1.1 or 1.06 or 05, or it becomes a game and, and all the energy goes to your compute. And that's sort of your point, too. Make sure that that energy is being used well in the compute. Totally agree. Uh, that's that. I totally, yeah, you couldn't have said that better. <laughs> uh, up here in the front. Yeah, thanks. Uh, I was interested at the point at which the decisions are being made, the point in the whole of the process, when the decisions are being made that have these uh, these effects. It sounded low, as though quite a lot was being decided at the point when the investment was being made in the infrastructure, yes. which is clearly a one-off occasional decision, would usually involve a number of people, uh, less of an issue about getting the information there. But then you're talking about the advantages of keeping the data center managers accountable for all their data center costs, including energy, yep. lies an ongoing. What additional value is added by that once you've got the right sort of infrastructure in place in the first place? The the value that's added is if if uh, the IT or the HPC manager gets whatever ten or twenty million dollar ten millions of dollars a year to run it. If he can run it as efficiently as possible, he can spend the added money to buy more compute time, new, uh, newer computers sooner. So instead of spending it on the energy, spend it on the next generation. Spend it on computes. Spend it on something useful. That's the idea. 
It's not easy, actually, uh, but that's the idea. What's the relative proportions of those two uh, elements of saving? How much is it the initial investment as opposed to ongoing? Um, the, it's another difficult question. Um, most of, <coughs> it, it takes a few years, goes to buying the right equipment first. Um, in the lifetime of the equipment, you'll spend more on the energy than on the equipment, in the lifetime being, say, three or four years. Um, so I guess I don't know that in, uh, in dollars per year. Uh, it goes back to that first graph. And the message is, obviously, to make it as efficient as possible. I don't, I don't know that answer directly. I'm, I'm sorry. I understand your question. It's of, of, if you spent $10 million to buy it and it's $2 million a year to run it, that's your question. And it's, it's on that order uh, that the energy costs, about, uh, costs more than the equipment does. That, that's totally a function of your cost of electricity, obviously. I don't think there are many uh, organizations yeah. here, including universities. No, yeah. Okay. So good. <laughs> and and it, you know our costs. Yeah. yeah. Well, and then the classic problem is the HPC manager doesn't see that cost. It's it's spread across the university. So so this maybe gets a good summary slide. Uh, don't be afraid of liquids. If you don't measure it, you can't uh, manage it. Um, uh, metrics will lead us to towards towards sustainability as PUE is done. ERE will lead us to reusing energy. Uh, back to the carbon question, there's another metric called carbon use effectiveness. Uh, again, this is a green grid. You can serve, uh, search for that. Um, but it's, it's carbon use per computation, if you want to call it that. A very useful metric to a lot of the discussions in this room. But that's what's going to drive us to sustainable computing. Um, energy efficient computing, it's all about the ones. This is the gentleman in the middle of the room. That's where the energy goes. Make it, make it useful. Make it as good as possible. Don't, don't store junk data. Don't, you know, all those things. Uh, that's where it is. We should make the facility as good as possible. Use the waste heat, but make the compute as efficient as possible. Um, and then holistic approaches um, to energy management. You know, lots of open questions how to best do that to use the waste heat. Um, maybe that we're starting to move towards projects may get an energy allocation rather than a watt node allocation. You know, you're given a megawatt hour, you charge, you're given a megawatt hour to run your job or, you know, whatever the case. Um, I, I see this changing as time goes on. So that's some, some parting thoughts anyhow, and you guys probably have some more thoughts, and that was, that was it. Yeah, we can keep discussing as long as you guys would like, yeah. That's just a practical question. Yeah. On, um so you've um, got specialist hardware, and you've got a model which you know um, you have to have that specialist hardware. How long is that commitment for? How long will you have to run that specialist hardware before you can change model again? So if the next great thing comes out, say tomorrow, how long would it take you to change? So, so it's an interesting question. That I don't know if you're getting towards the lease model, but we we physically bought the equipment. We said uh, HP in this case. Uh, we need a petaflop of computing, and we need this much storage, and it needs to you know, run at 480 volt direct, and all those sorts of things, but then we bought it. Uh, typical in the HPC world is three or four year switch out. I don't know if that's typical here, uh, but it's when the computers get that much better. A few generations, every generation gets better, typically three or four years. but. The, there's a bigger question, gets back to the question in the room of when do you really need to upgrade it? You know, when is it used, do the same computations for half the energy, which, which certainly they've been getting much better. But I, I don't know that offhand. Typical is three or four years. To say the numbers come up with our cooling being more efficient in three to four years, would you then have to rip out most of your infrastructure as well? Oh, I, I got it. No. Um, let's say we bought, bought the next generation of HP computers. What, H, what they do and Cray and everybody does the same, is they run the liquid cooling up to a heat exchanger, cooling distribution units, they call them, CDUs. So the facility water would stay there. That, that CDU would be there, but you'd pull out the, uh, the boards, the servers, out of the HP racks and put the newest generation, plug it in. So the physical infrastructure would stay there, but the, the, the server, the actual board, would, would get changed out. Is that... That, is that your question? So the liquid is, is built so it goes directly into the racks and uh, cools the boards directly. In their case, they use heat pipes, so everything just kind of slides in and direct contact. Uh, but you can pull it out and put the newest, greatest thing in. 
So, but it, it's similar to an air cooled if you want to think of it that way. It's in a rack. You pull the old <coughs> server out and you put the newest server in. That's how it's envisioned, anyways. <laughs> Well, um, I think we're going to have to sure. draw this to a close. And if there's any burning questions, I'll tell you you're here the rest of the day, aren't you? Uh, till mid-afternoon, and certainly through lunch anyways, if we're going to go to lunch, yeah, which... Anything. Yeah. I think that's been the most um, um, illuminating. It's Good. As, as bright as your uh, tie. Oh, thank you. I'm a solar guy, so yeah, i got to wear a solar tie. Green, thank you. <laughs> um, I must say, I really like the look of your campus. That's quite something. Yeah, thank you. And, and I do have cards. Peter and I are in constant contact. But if you're ever in the U.S. and in, in Denver, which is non-trivial, but, but do let me know, and I can show you around um, our, our campus.